Hi everyone, Mike here from Bikes by Mike with another cycling related video. I'm back upstairs to give you my three month review of the Aerofit Pro respiratory training device. Like everything training related, it's difficult to validate the performance benefits claimed by the company trying to sell you their product. But I'll do my best to separate the hype from the hard facts. And I'll give you my personal take on whether I've seen any improvement benefits during the three months I've been using the device. Okay, let's get to it. I purchased the Aerofit Pro after reading about it in Pez Cycling News earlier this summer. I heard about breathing training devices before, but I was really intrigued at the comment made in the article that training your respiratory system with the Aerofit could increase your VO2 max. Now, even though a lot of reviewers say that the Aerofit claims that their device can increase VO2 max, that isn't exactly what they are saying. What they are actually claiming is that the Aerofit can improve one's performance through inspiratory strength training, which in turn improves one's lung capacity. But more on that later. You can understand why VO2 max, or maximal oxygen uptake as it often is called, gets mentioned so often. Because we, as cyclists, just like all other endurance athletes, are desperate for anything that might improve our VO2 max because that really is one of the key markers that indicates level of aerobic fitness and overall endurance. We also know all too well how difficult it is to increase VO2 max, particularly for those that are already heavily trained. So now that I've bought this thing and I've tested it out for three months, I wanna share with you my two cents. I'm not going to do an unboxing or tell you all the features or settings with Aerofit because there are hundreds of videos on that. What I'm really interested in, and I hope you are interested in as well, is whether this thing works. I'll start things off by talking about how the Aerofit works and what it claims to be able to do. Then I'll look to what the research says about the potential benefits of respiratory training devices like the Aerofit Pro. Next, I'll show you my training data from using the Aerofit daily, well, kind of daily, for the past three months and whether anecdotally I think it has improved my athletic performance. And then I'll wrap this up with my final thoughts. I'll tell you whether I think the Aerofit Pro and the newer Aerofit 2.0 will benefit cyclists like you and me and comment on breathing training in general. The Aerofit Pro is a respiratory training device that helps you train and strengthen your diaphragm and intercostal muscles. It measures your breathing volume and strength and sends this data via Bluetooth to a smartphone app, the Virtual Breathing Coach. With all your data tracked nicely in the app, you can view your progress and trends over time. The key metrics the Aerofit tracks is vital lung capacity, inspiratory strength, and expiratory strength. The app can also be used to guide you through specific training sessions, and there is a lot there to choose from. Or you can choose one specific training program, or focus as they call it, which is what I did. So day after day, I simply follow the training sessions they've set up for me, based on my main focus area being cycling. Okay, so this is the first time I'm using the Aerofit, so I'm just going to do my first baseline lung test and that'll be used to compare my progress over time. So here we go. So I'll open up the Aerofit app on my iPhone. And as soon as you open it, the first thing it wants you to do is take the lung test. So that's what I'm going to do. Test your lungs. All right, wants me to watch a video. I don't want to do that. Welcome to the Aerofit app. We're so excited. Looks like it's forcing me to watch the whole video. I've seen this video before. All right, so now we can start the lung test. It's asking me to turn on the unit. Set the out dial to 6 and the in dial to F. And I'll start by, so what does it want me to do? Empty your lungs completely. Inhale as hard as you can and exhale as hard as you can. All right, here we go.
Wow, that was intense, but it's short. So it looks like my volume, my baseline volume is record, that's recording right now is 5.3 liters. A respiratory is 61, and expiratory is 67. So I'm satisfied with that. I'll hit finish, and that's it. So why do you need to strengthen your lung muscles? Well, there are many inspiratory muscles that are activated to bring air into the lungs, but the main one is the diaphragm. And it has been shown that the diaphragm and other inspiratory muscles can in fact be strengthened through proper training. The benefit to strengthening the diaphragm is that it will allow you to breathe more efficiently and put otherwise wasted energy to better use, like improving your endurance. Before we talk about the research, let me go back to my earlier point that AirFit does not claim to be able to improve VO2 max. Their claim is that you can help improve your performance through inspiratory strength training, which in turn improves one vital lung capacity. Vital lung capacity is the total volume of air your lungs can bring in and is determined by the physical size of your lung. So it's genetically determined. It's a known fact that we cannot enlarge the size of our lungs in any way, including through training. So if you can't change the size of the balloon, what benefit could there then be in strengthening your lung muscles? Well, VO2 max or maxogen oxygen uptake is how much oxygen your body absorbs and uses while working out. V is for volume, O2 is for oxygen, and max is for maximum. It is a process called diffusion where oxygen moves from the alveoli in the lungs to the blood through the capillaries through the lining of the alveolar walls. The number of alveoli you have will be in proportion to the size of your lungs. No amount of training will allow you to grow additional alveoli. No amount of training will make your lungs larger. Respiratory muscle training is not correlated with VO2 max. But respiratory training can allow you to get more out of the engine you already have. Studies have shown that in some cases, athletes with a lower VO2 max can produce better aerobic performance than those with a higher VO2 max. The thing is that nobody is using their full lung capacity. But by training your lung muscles, you can effectively use more of your vital lung capacity and just make better use of what you already have. During high intensity exercise, respiratory muscles consume 10 to 15% of VO2 max and are prone to fatiguing, especially for long and hard efforts. By making your lung muscles operate more efficiently, you can redirect some of that otherwise wasted oxygen consumption to better use, like powering your legs. Another way to look at it is that it will allow you to lower your effective VO2 max, which is the VO2 max needed for a particular intensity and distance. Okay, so to be absolutely clear, no one, including Aerofit, claims that through training you can alter what you were born with. But let's look to the research to see if indeed you can train your lung muscles to operate more efficiently and save you energy, which will then allow you to better utilize the lung capacity you already have. One of the first studies published in 2001 looked at whether inspiratory muscle training improves rowing performance. This study took 14 female competitive rowers and put them through an 11 week inspiratory muscle training program. After the program, they discovered that lung muscle strength increased by 45.3% compared to just 5.3% in the control group. More importantly, the IMT trained group increased their six minute all out effort distance by 3.5% as compared to just 1.6% in the control group. Is that encouraging? Uh, yeah, I'd be really happy to improve my performance by 3.6%. On the flip side, a 2001 study on 21 male and females was not nearly as positive. The study authors conclude that RMT is effective for improving respiratory strength, but did not facilitate greater improvements to stimulate 2000 meter rowing performance. Another early study looking at how inspiratory muscle training influences exercise tolerance was conducted back in 2010. 16 recreational subjects were put through a four-week IMT training program. After four weeks, the researchers found that maximum inspiratory pressure was significantly increased and inspiratory muscle fatigue was reduced after high-intensity efforts. The authors concluded by saying, 
These results demonstrate that IMT, presumably through reducing the extent of fatigue and therefore the metabolic requirements of the inspiratory muscles during high intensity exercise, enhance VO2 dynamics and exercise tolerance. Okay, what about swimmers? A 2013 study looked at whether respiratory muscle training improves swimming performance. This study put 10 swimmers through an eight week respiratory muscle endurance training program and measured overall ventilatory function as well as athletic performance. A control group of 10 other swimmers was used. The lung training group improved their times in the 50 and 200 meter events by 3% and 4% respectively, while similar improvements were not observed in the control group. A 2012 meta-analysis on the effect of respiratory muscle training on exercise performance helped to consolidate the results of past studies. After looking at the results of 46 studies, the authors concluded that less fit subjects benefit more from RMT than highly trained athletes. However, all types of RMT can be used to improve exercise performance in healthy subjects. Looking at the more recent literature, a 2019 systemic review of the benefits of respiratory muscle training concluded that past evidence demonstrating an improvement in endurance exercise following RMT is affirmed by recent investigations. Although it is noted that the effect of RMT on performance in other exercise modes such as short duration or intermittent exercise is presently unclear. So looking at what has been some pretty extensive study on the performance benefits of respiratory muscle training, one can see that the balance of evidence is that devices used to improve lung muscle strength will improve endurance performance. So in my opinion, AeroFit's self-stated performance claims cannot be ignored. Okay, now that we've looked at some of the popular research on this topic, and given that it points to the fact that AeroFit should make me fitter and faster, let's see if it actually has after using it for three months. I started using the AeroFit on September 8, 2022, and my last recording used for this analysis was December 31st, so 115 calendar days. On 34 days, I missed a training session, so in total, I have 81 days over a three month period to pull data from. I picked the cycling training program, what AeroFit calls a focus area, so I just followed all the training sessions they recommended for me. The sessions started out quite short at around five minutes to complete two exercises, but the training time has ramped up steadily to where I'm now doing three consecutive exercises a day, totaling about 20 minutes. That's about the limit to which I want or can do this training. By the 20 minute mark, my lung muscles are pretty shot. The average session time for everyone using AeroFit is under 10 minutes, so I'm a bit surprised AeroFit is suggesting a daily training program that is this long. Now let's look at my performance in the three most often cited data points when looking at respiratory muscle training. These are vital lung capacity, inspiratory strength, and expiratory strength. As I mentioned, vital lung capacity or accessible lung capacity is the amount of air your lungs can actually take in and push out. Bigger vital lung capacity ultimately means more circulating oxygen, which has a host of benefits. Vital lung capacity is influenced by the strength of your diaphragm and intercostal muscles, those muscles between your ribs. My lowest lung capacity reading was 4.36 liters recorded on September 8th, which is when I started, and a high of 8.57 on November 19th. I actually took two baseline readings on September 8th, and you saw from my earlier video that for the first test, I recorded slightly better values across all three metrics but I'll use the poor results here. So I've increased my lung capacity by 24% over the three month period, which puts me in the top 11% of all AeroFit users. I'm pretty happy with that. Now, let's look at inspiratory muscle strength. AeroFit is actually measuring respiratory pressure here in centimeters of water, which is a good indicator of inspiratory strength. AeroFit has separate adjustable airflow restrictor dials that control the amount of resistance during inhalation and exhalation. My lowest inspiratory strength was 57.7 centimeters of water recorded on September 8th. And my highest recording was 97.7 recorded on December 23rd. I've increased my inspiratory strength on average by 7.6% over three months 
which puts me in the top 27% of all Aerofit users. Again, I'm pretty happy with that. Finally, let's look at expiratory muscle strength. This, as you might have guessed, is the opposite of inspiratory muscle strength, it is the pressure at which you're expelling air from your lungs. My lowest expiratory strength was 76.4 recorded on September 8th, and my highest recording was 96.7 recorded on October 11th. My performance has gone down by 22.7%, which now puts me in the bottom 4% of all Aerofit users. That's like horrible. And I can't quite understand why my performance had been so bad as compared to the other two areas, especially since my vital lung capacity has been improving steadily. My guess is that maybe it's related to my technique. Maybe I'm just focusing too much on the inhalation and my exhalation is suffering. Or maybe by putting more effort into the inhalation, I have less strength for exhalation. If anyone can explain what's going on here, please comment below. So to recap, I've seen some pretty significant improvements when looking at trend lines for both vital lung capacity and inspiratory strength. Unfortunately, my expiratory strength has been on the steady decline. First things first, a big disclaimer. In no way have I been able to measure my aerobic improvements while using the AeroFit in any way that resembles a controlled experiment. Right? Like really. My impression is little more than anecdotal with a few data metrics thrown in. If you want something more objective, go back to my earlier part of this video where I talk about the research. That's where the evidence lies. To make things worse, my fitness and overall health during the three month period of time I've been using AeroFit Pro has changed significantly and independently of my use of Aerofit. I had a bad road cycling accident at the end of July that put me in the trauma ward, left me with broken bones, road rash, punctured lung, and torn rotator cuff muscles. So from the end of July to mid-September, I was unable to do any weight training and very little cardio training. My level of fitness dropped from the best it has ever been after completing the Oat Root Pyrenees race to the worst level I've ever recorded in the last nine years. So I've had to rebuild my body for the last five months of 2022, focusing on strength and flexibility in addition to cardio. I've also done more strength training and long base miles than I've ever done before. So I've upped my training considerably to try to get back to where I was before the accident. As of the end of this year, I'm close to the fitness level I would expect to be at this time of the year. All that to say that even without using the AeroFit, I would expect to see above average month over month improvements in my fitness since my starting point after the accident was so far below my baseline norm. And I've been putting in extra time. In assessing my cardiovascular improvements while using the AeroFit, I've looked at my power data during two all out full gas virtual races. Let's look at the first race I did on October 8th which was one month after first starting to use the AeroFit Pro and about three weeks into resuming any kind of cardio training. The race was a distance of 43 kilometers with 402 meters of climbing, which for me was a one hour and 13 minute effort. I averaged 211 watts with a normalized power of 220 watts. My 60 minute peak power was 210 watts, well below my pre-accident FTP of 260 watts. The second race was held on December 30th. It was a distance of 40 kilometers with 228 meters of climbing, which for me was a one hour and four minute effort to complete the race. I averaged 238 watts with a normalized power of 242 watts. Here, my 60 minute peak power was 236 watts. Using my 60 minute peak power numbers for the two races, you can see that the power increased by 12.4% for the 12 weeks separating these two races. I would rate my level of effort or RPE as roughly the same for both races, say a nine out of 10 on a hardness scale. So while the fitness improvements I've experienced in the past three months are very good, I have no way of knowing how much of that I can attribute to the AeroFit Pro. My gut feel is that some of it, but not the most of it is. But because I've been doing these breathing exercises almost daily, I do pay more attention now to how I breathe and I alter my breathing when I catch myself doing bad things like reverting to short and shallow breaths.
What I've noticed is that I'm generally more on top of my breathing when exercising than what I used to be. In the past, on all out aerobic efforts, I'd find that I get short of breath. I now find this happens less often. It obviously doesn't mean that I don't get hammered during rides, but rather that the limiting factor that will cause me to stop is that either my legs have given out or my body just can't turn the pedals anymore. It's generally not because I feel I'm running out of breath or that I might start hyperventilating. So that's a good thing. So here now are my final thoughts on the AeroFit Pro and breathing exercises in general. Overall, I give the AeroFit a big thumbs up. It's legit. It's not snake oil. This device can improve your aerobic performance and it does by way of tried and proven respiratory muscle training techniques. Also, the companion smartphone app makes it easy to track your progress and just makes training with it more interesting. As for the negatives, two things come to mind. First, with respect to the design. The E-unit is removed from the body of the device by squeezing it on both sides and pulling it off. The part of the E-unit you pinch is made of really thin plastic and I'm always worried I'll crack it while pinching it and pulling it off. Actually, you can already see what appears to be stress marks close to where my fingers pinch the plastic. Second is price. The AeroFit Pro retails for $402 Canadian dollars and the AeroFit Pro 2.0, $469. And if you want the benefit of all the smartphone features, you will need to pay an annual subscription service of $40. Only you can decide if that cash outlay is worth it to you. Next, there are a lot of sporting disciplines that adopt breathing training routines for their elite athletes. The ones that stand out are swimming, particularly synchronized swimming, rowing, running, and of course, cycling. So the fact that the science backs its efficacy and that it is so widely used among elite athletes should be enough to demonstrate its worth. And as good as diaphragmatic breathing can be for improving athletic performance, it may be even better for speeding up recovery and promoting good overall mental health. Yogis have recognized the benefit of breathing exercises for more than 3,500 years. So it's probably time the masses wake up and recognize its benefit as well. While being in a hyper state of stress is fine while working out, you need to tranquilize your system to start the recovery process as quickly as possible to promote the super compensation physiological response that we all need to get physically stronger. Basically post-exercise, you want to activate your body's rest and digest parasympathetic nervous system and training with AeroFit Pro can help you achieve this easier. Take a listen to this discussion on one of my favorite podcasts. How about breathing in between sets um, and maybe even after the workout? Yeah, you're not going to see any athlete that I work with just breathe in between. Whether it's in between innings or in between rounds, every single one of them is going to go back sit in the stool, and they're going to immediately be into a breathing routine. And if you're losing that opportunity post-exercise, you're leaving gains on the table, if you will. So not only are you going to see every of the athletes that I work with mostly have a breathing strategy in competition, we're not going to just finish a workout, high five, drink water, and walk out of the gym. There will be a down-regulation strategy that is heavily involved with some sort of light control as well as breath control. I love this and I started doing this because you and Brian McKenzie informed me about this and it completely changed the rate of recovery for me. And I noticed two things. One, I recovered more quickly, workout to workout, no question about it. Yeah. The numbers um, told me that. And the other is that I used to have this um, dip in energy that would occur three or four hours after a hard workout. And I always thought that had to do with the fact that I had generally eaten a meal at some point post-workout. Mm. Turns out it wasn't the meal at all. Yeah. It's that 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 adrenaline um, ramp up during the workouts. I wasn't clamping that at the end. And so I think eventually it's it just leaking. crashed. And then three or four hours later, I'm, I'm having a hard time even reading what's on the screen of my computer, thinking maybe it's the screen, maybe it was what I ate for lunch. Turns out the down regulations allowed me to work through the afternoon with no issues whatsoever. Yeah, it's if, really been quite powerful. And so I'm grateful to you for that. And I think this is something that I think 98% of people are not doing. Um, you need some sort of internal signal that we're safe. Like 
throttle down here, and we're going to move on. That has to happen. Um, I, I could go on and on here, but I, I think we're making the same point kind of over again. It's a big deal to do it. That concludes my review of the AeroFit Pro respiratory training device and my thoughts on the benefits of incorporating some form of breathing exercises into your training routine. I hope some of this has been helpful. If you have any questions or comments, please pass them along. I know there are a lot of different views on this topic, and I'm happy to hear from those with a different perspective. That's all I've got for today, folks. If you like this video, please give me a thumbs up and share it with your friends. And if you're not subscribed to this channel, please subscribe as it allows me to produce more content for all of you. See you next time. Happy rolling.